Hi everybody. Hello, hello. Uh, welcome to the next reading of Tao Te Ching by Mysterious Lao Tzu. And today I'm co-hosting with really good poet Cordell, right? Oh. Okay. Uh, so today we are reading chapter seven. Hmm. The translation by Stephen Mitchell. The Tao is infinite, eternal. Why is it eternal? It was never born. Thus, it can never die. Why is it infinite? It has no desires for itself. Thus, it is present for all beings. The master stays behind. That is why she is ahead. She is detached from all things. That is why she is one with them. Because she has let go of herself. She is perfectly fulfilled. Kurda. So this will be the translation by Jim Kladfelter. Yes. This presence is unlimited because it wasn't ever born and it will not be perishing, will never give you cause to mourn. It truly wants for nothing. It has no wishes of its own. It is the one and only, eternally alone. It holds itself in vacancy, with no desire to advance, remaining in simplicity. It merely witnesses the dance. The seer will remain behind and never yearn for leaving home, just living in the here and now, prefers to stay unknown. That's beautiful. Hmm. That I, I do understand. Yes, I do understand why it's your favorite chapter. <laughs> hmm. I. Well, it talks about two essential things, you know. The concept that there is no birth, there is no death. There is just infinity. And I like that concept, you know, that things don't just stop. And I can actually relate to it on a rational side. Like, on a rational side, I remember, um, well, in French we call it La Loi de Lavoisier. I think it's got another name in English. But it's basically this concept of nothing is created and nothing is destroyed everything transforms in uh, in chemistry mm. at least and uh, i think it's one of those um, empiric universal rules rather than something that just specific to chemistry and i think chinese people have understood that and probably you know like people like lavoisier read some texts about spiritualism and that concept of infinity with no beginning, no end, you know. Mm. And the second part I really like is that concept of the last will be the first and the first, you know, will end up being the last because the last one is the first. And the truth is, it's, uh, it's pretty much there in almost all religions that concept that the person that will let everybody pass in front of them will be honored respected will be the first one will be i don't know what 
Hell, I would argue that even in social behavior, we encourage people for to do the right thing, you know. And the right thing is often self-sacrifice to save a bunch of other people or things like that, you know. The right thing is never, let's abuse 10,000 people and get rich for myself, you know. That is definitely not, at least not what we teach kids, that is the right thing, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I like those two concepts. And achieving peace through those two concepts does seem like something that is, you know, logical enough for me to understand. I do have to say that I feel this chapter is tied to another chapter, though. Uh, because I can't remember it exactly. I'm sure it comes further along. But mm -hmm. this concept that... Uh, that concept of detachment yeah. that is written in these poems, I like it a lot. But it can be misunderstood. And I remember reading a chapter in which they emphasize that one doesn't have to go to the point of breaking but rather to the point of you know being flexible bending mm. rather than forcing to to stay fixed and breaking because you don't move or something like that you know and, and this is the part that i slightly criticize in this part read by itself is that it gives the impression that if a person detaches himself completely of possession, love, and stuff like that, he will achieve nirvana or, you know, peace spiritually, which is not the truth. The mm. truth is, one has to be aware of what is love, why they love, what is the nature of it, why they being loved back, and then a person can truly understand all of the meaning of it, rather than just saying, I'm just going to detach myself from everything and then give away everything. You know, it's too strict. Yeah. But I, I'm pretty sure there is a chapter where they explain that, they emphasize that concept. Yes. I uh, um, was wondering uh, about the concept uh, which was mentioned at the beginning. The Tao is infinite, eternal. Why is it eternal? Of course, it was never born, thus it can never die. So, the Tao is this forever presence, which is which is the void and nothingness in itself. So, the Tao is like in between things. <laughs> like, it's it's actually basically dances around the word void. The way I would translate it in Western spirituality and theology yeah. is the, the concept of Holy Spirit. You know, like, mm -hmm. I, I know it's kind of hard to conceptualize, but that idea that the divine Godhood is in everything. If it's in everything, yeah. then, you know, it's the sky, it's the plant, it's the tree, it's you, it's your enemy, it's your mother, father, sons, daughters, it's everything, you know? And in that sense, the Tao kind of like makes sense, you know? The Tao is, is everything, and at the same time, it's nothing. It, it's that nothingness inside of everything. And I would argue that actually, if you watch like anything like Star Wars, it's mm. probably high of this concept, you know, like the force is everything, but then you have the Sith and the Jedi and the light and dark side, it's totally yin and yang and that yep. stuff. Uh, well, uh, Luke said to, to Ray that uh, the force is not dark or light, the force is in between. The force is everything, the birth and the decay. He actually said it to her. Ah, he and I also like in uh, chapter six, I think uh, they said we are made of it. We are born out of it. 
but it makes sense when you think about it because for example if you take a plant you can look at it as a whole like that is a plant or you know like you have the flower and the plant so you, you could then you know emphasize the flower mm -hmm. and say okay there is the flower and then yeah. you can emphasize the flower by saying there is the petal and go further and further inside eventually you get to this um, subatomic thing, level subatomic level and that subatomic level even in scientific mm -hmm. concepts in theory, you know in theory mm -hmm. they say it's all the same for everyone and everything that exists in the universe so you know in that sense i would argue that um religious people and uh, free-minded spirits are extremely similar because they hold the same belief that everything mm -hmm. is made of the same thing now i personally find that super interesting you know it's one of those theories that when you read about you discover that everybody's wrong about fighting about it because actually mm -hmm. everybody thinks exactly the same the scientific argue that the people of religion argue that and everybody in between says you know everything is connected and then you've got some people that get obsessed by the idea that not everything is connected mm -hmm. and you know it's it becomes a singular hegemonic closed perspective yeah. because the truth yeah whatever or fate whatever or politics whatever resemblance hell we could be from different species in this planet i could be like a snail and you could be a bird and we would still be connected by some essential fabric of the universe basically yeah it it has no desires for itself Thus, it is present for all beings. Does it mean that Tao is not self-aware? I Just think... This thing in between spaces, I always keep thinking... How is it present in, inside all of us and yet it's a void? I personally think the big misconception is to believe that we are more aware than anything else in the universe we barely are i mean we often scratch the surface of doubts you know like mm -hmm. what is the nature of being what is the nature of the universe what is all those concepts we we barely touch on it and most of all social endeavor or social habit and stuff like that i'm pretty sure we're not aware of them like okay if i breathe every second you know yeah. this is like the first time i'm actually controlling my breathing in days you know mm -hmm. not actively doing it yet i'm doing it and it's the same concept with tao you know the more you try to control your breathing, the less it will be natural. But at the same time, if you don't pay too much attention about it and you just ignore your breathing all the time, you could find yourself hyper ventilating because you're doing too much running, for example, and not paying attention to your body. And that's the idea, you know, it's that by not doing, doing doing by not doing you know mm -hmm. not being aware of what we're doing while doing it make it makes it easy to do you know yeah uh, the master stays behind that is why she's ahead she's detached from all things i mean it's bound to the previous sentence she has no desires but she's present in all of beings. But, but she stays behind. 
But she's they detached. Make, they make a beautiful link between the master and the Tao. Mm -hmm. And that's... It's, it's again, you know, the, this concept of what's within us makes us makes what we are, you know, and uh, then we become it, you know, mm -hmm. like a person can achieve harmony and peace of mind. I'm not arguing all the time or stuff like that, but it can be achieved for a little while and stuff like that. And And find peace of it, it right, you know, balance. The same kind of balance that there is, I want to say, in nature, you know. Yeah. Uh, I would actually argue that the human nature is in a way a reflection of the planet Earth, for example. Yeah. We couldn't exist the way we exist if Earth hadn't been the environment in which we lived, you know? Yeah. You're right. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. <laughs> Because she let go of herself, she's perfectly fulfilled. No. Oh. Does, does it talk about the master not having cravings, not having basically an ego, desires, just being in this state of bliss and presence? Does, is that the main concept of Tao? Well... Well, I would say that um, it is one of the issues with this chapter. It gives a, an impression that one has to let go of everything, when really the Tao is not specifically about that. However, that said, there is something in having faith without having a need of proof, um, loving unconditionally, um, knowing something without having to see it, you know, like, for example, I know the earth is round and that it goes round around the sun, you know, and yet I've never observed it from the, you know, from space, for example, mm -hmm. I wish I had. You know, it's one of my little dreams, but I know it's never going to happen. Yet I know it. And there is something to that. You know, the that point of awareness when a person doesn't have to question what they're doing and they just do it. Yeah. And because they don't question, they don't have to run after it. In the sense that, you know, for example, let us say I was extremely ambitious. And my dream was to become the richest and most powerful of all writers. And I would be obsessed by it. By being obsessed, I would ruin the activity of writing poetry the way I understand it. Exactly. So, and it's all... This chapter has to be taken by itself within the rest of other chapters mm -hmm. yeah I get it I will need to think about this chapter more but basically uh, my, my own conclusion from it is that in order to be the master of Tao I would have to be 
I would have to know that Tao is within me and it, it is present in everything, everywhere. I will have to know that I'm a part of everything. They will just be. That's it. That's very much it. That's very, very much it. Mm. Okay. Uh, thank you once again, Cordell, for giving your wise input. I right, thank you for inviting me. I'm always inviting you. <laughs> Delight. <laughs> thank you, everybody, for joining us today and please check out all the links below uh, join us on Pinder Poet Society we're always there <laughs> and yeah just give us a shout out in comments and subscribe to Cordell's YouTube channel the link is also below bye Bye.